sometimes I'll be teaching and I realize I'll say something that could plausibly be interpreted as politically incorrect, even though it's not intentional. Just it's fun to have yourself recorded when you're like, all right, I need to edit this like 20 second thing out of my lecture. Um, okay, so what was going on with last week is we were talking a lot about continuous variables. Right? We are talking about taking samples, um, forming, uh, finding the mean for each of those samples, and finding a confidence interval to surround the mean. Well, it turns out that a lot of the things we do in statistics are not based on continuous variables. We're often very interested oh, that went too far. Um, we're interested in perhaps classification. Let's say that we have a situation where we want to Coins are just the thing that, for some reason, statisticians, we just default to talking about coins, and then we complain about how often we talk about coin flipping. Um, we'll just use it as a simple example here. Um, so we're going to look at something called the Bernoulli distribution as the basis for what we're going to talk about, which is the binomial distribution. Um, Bernoulli distribution is pretty simple. If x is a binary outcome of a trial, and a trial is just like we flip a coin, right? X equals 1 if it's a success. And so this could be, it's up to you how you define success here. Perhaps it's getting heads and 0 if you get tails. The probability of a success, or X equals 1, is P. So if you have a fair coin, what's the value of P? 50% or 0.5. Um, and this is something, of course, when we're thinking about flipping a coin, and we'll get into talking about gambling in a second. You know, I'm going to try not to talk too much about gambling, but enough about it so it's a little interesting. Um, we say that this variable, x, is, has a Bernoulli distribution. Bernoulli distribution, so we just say x is distributed Bernoulli with P, whatever the probability of a success is in that case. So this looks a little bit different. Up to this point, we really talked about um, x or our variables being normally distributed with some mean and some variance. Now we are talking about um, a distribution where the parameter is the probability. Okay? This is not. Um, this is a very important one, and. This is something, like again, with terminology and things like that. We're gonna, the binomial distribution is built on the notion of repeated Bernoulli trials, or essentially looking at a sum of Bernoulli distributions. So if we say y is the number of successes in n iid, okay, this is probably important. When I say iid, do you guys have any idea what I mean? All right, good. I just wanted to double check. Um, okay, so it stands for independent and identically distributed. So let's break that down. So first word, independent. When I say one trial, like a Bernoulli trial, is independent of another, what do you think I mean by that? Yes, absolutely. So me flipping a coin and seeing heads doesn't influence what happens when I flip the coin again. This is also why Vegas makes lots of money off of people who go there. They assume, they're like, oh, well, there have been 10 reds and, in roulette. There has to be a black one coming. No, that doesn't, that's not true. <laughs> but people will bet, so if you watch how people behave in casinos, and this is you know, casinos are watching where you move and like exactly what's been going on at the table to know when people are going to bet a lot more money. Very often if people see, oh, there's been seven blacks in a row, I'm going to put a whole lot of money on seeing a red next. No, these things, these trials are independent of each other. This goes back to this idea when we're talking about independent, we're talking about like a random number sequence. 
you can tell that a human made it because you're very unlikely to see a whole string of like ones or zeros. Even though seeing four or five ones in a row is just as likely as seeing a one zero one zero one. This is just something we tend to put patterns and see patterns where they and attribute meaning to those patterns when the meaning is not actually there. Um, Vegas is very happy about that. And of course, when you add things like you know free drinks to it. Well, people's and any intuition they had is definitely gone. Um, okay, identically distributed. This means that we have the same p or proportion for all of our trials. So if we're flipping a coin, assume it's a fair coin, each time that we flip it, p is 0.5. Okay? So this is saying that this p value is not changing across time. So there are some important things, but we're going to come back and we're going to use IID a lot, so I wanted to make sure that we defined it. And if, when we use um, terms in here and phrases, if it's not immediately clear to you, make sure you just raise your hand and we can go back into detail about it. So why is the number of successes in N IID Bernoulli trials? If that's the case, so why is essentially rep representing the number of successes in N Bernoulli trials we say that y has a binomial distribution. And that binomial distribution has two parameters. One is n, which essentially in this case is how many times you flip the coin. And p is the probability of success for each one of those trials. So there are some important things that, um, and in this particular class and even in another one, there's not a lot of derivation type things, but it's important to understand what we think should happen. When we talk about things like expected value, which is E of X, we are talking about what we expect to happen in the long run over these repeated trials. Well. There are, um, in the case where we say one is a success and zero represents failure, well, one times, so the probability of x being one is just p, right? It's our probability of success. And the probability of x being zero, it, the probability of x being zero is still one minus p. But it, we have zero in front of it. We're saying we assign every time that we see um, x equals zero, whatever probability, which is going to be 1 minus p in this case, we're just multiplying it by zero. So this second part of the term right here is not going to have any influence on what this value is. So this turns out to be just 1 times p or p. So we're saying the expected value of uh, this random variable x <clears throat> is just p. And while we won't go through and do the derivation, the variance of this variable is p times 1 minus p. So these things do matter quite a bit. Because when we're talking about the variance, we can then say, well, if I take the square root of the variance, I can get the standard deviation, right? So these things are important. Um, of course, we're talking in notation and not in specific examples right now. And what I will try to do and encourage you to do is, in the past, I've ended up providing like a full-on notation sheet. Um, before I do something like that this semester, I want you to think about trying to make your own notation sheet. It's much more meaningful for you to generate one and write things down next to it because you might need certain information that not another person doesn't need. Um, but certainly if the notation starts to trip you up, um, talk to me about that and we'll try to get a reference sheet for you. Okay, so this was talking about Bernoulli, and so we're going to really change things up. Now we're talking about the mean and the variance of a binomial. So we said that the binomial is essentially just a sum 
of a whole bunch of Bernoulli random variables, which is what this says here. Y is really just x1 plus x2 all the way up to xn. So this particular step here, where we go from expected value and we're able to separate them, why do you think we're able to do that? If I can say the expectation of the sum is the sum of the expectations. What do we know about our x variable? Random variable. What qualities does it have? Yeah, it's three letters. They are independent from each other, so right. you can look at every single one and their identity just repeat. Okay, so that IID piece that we mentioned, they're independent and identically distributed. That is the reason that both in this case and here with the variance, that we can say, okay, the ex the expected value of the sum is the sum of the expected values and the variance of the sum is the sum of the variances. Okay. This, so this property of IID is extremely important particularly here. How do we jump from E of X1 all the way up to E of XN to N times P? Where does that come from? Not magic. I'm going to call on somebody who's not usual participating. Any volunteers from our quiet yet large table over here in the corner? If I tell you, so what we just looked at with Bernoulli random variables, the expected value of each one is p, right? So the expected value of x1 is also p. The expected value of x2 is also p. Hmm? Yeah. Exactly. Right. So we have n of these random variables, each with a probability of p. So our expected value is just n times p. Okay. This same logic applies to the variance. So, if you're not member, so the formulas here, yes, they're important, but it's mo it's really important that you understand the underlying logic, particularly in this transition step, from saying the expected value of the sum to the sum of the expected values. That that depends on the IID property of the variables. Okay, if you don't, if you can't assume independence, this step doesn't work. Can you explain a little bit more because you're having trouble? Um, so the binomial distribution is always a sum of Bernoulli distributions. A Bernoulli is just a single trial. So think about if I'm flipping a coin, a Bernoulli is just a single flip of that coin and its outcome. Where the expected value is p, the probability of success, in this case it would be 0.5, and the variance is p times 1 minus p. So Bernoulli is just a single trial. Okay. You're conducting a single experiment, and you're notating the outcome. It's a potential binomial. Uh, it is just, so it is the, the binomial is saying, now I'm going to look at all of these, a repeated number of Bernoulli trials. Okay, I'm going to do, I'm going to flip the coin n times. So for it to be Bernoulli, it has to have a binary. Yes, has to have a binary potential outcome, where the probability of success is just p. And that's not always 0.5. It could be, if you have an unfair coin, perhaps it's 0.6 and 0.4. Okay. So, if you're thinking about Bernoulli... So. And then the probability is always of success, right? Of success. So this is something that's going to come up in case of terminology. How we define success is a lot, a lot of cases non-intuitive in public health. <laughs> so, 
Very often when we get into talking about successes, I think that'll be in like week 10 of this semester, we'll say like a death is a success. So another way to say this is the outcome happens or an event occurs. Okay, and so if you say the event occurring is <clears throat> getting heads, that's another way to discuss it. But it can become a little bit confusing when we start talking about like having a disease and not having a disease, and we call having a disease a success, it doesn't fit, right? Just because it says success does not mean good. It just means an event occurred. Okay, so our estimates, right? So the reason that we talked about <clears throat> expected value and variance is so that we can figure out what estimates we should use for the mean and the variance and the standard deviation. Uh, just like before, we're, so we've used x bar to estimate mu. We've used s squared to estimate sigma squared. So, if we want to estimate p hat, well, our estimate is just going to be the number of successes over the number of trials that happen. So, if we, um, so let's say that we don't know how fair a coin is, right? We're not told in advance that it's a fair coin. So we might flip the coin a hundred times. And let's say we come up and we find that heads, which we're going to call a success, happen 75 times in these 100 trials. Well, our estimate for p hat is going to be 0.75. And <clears throat> our variance and standard deviation, consequently, are going to behave uh, similarly, we're gonna, it's going to obviously change to be 0.75 times 1 minus 0.75 over 1. So this is, this assumption is when you don't know a priori when you're going into an experiment exactly what is going to happen. Like, so let's suppose you need to come up with this distribution yourself. This is a lot of times where pilot studies happen where you need to determine what the parameters are. So you run a repeated number of trials to determine what this parameter p is going to be. Okay. I don't want to hold you back, but p hat is just what is that? It's our estimate of uh, p. So p hat, so like with x bar, actually that should not have hat over it. Um, yes, I will adjust that. So when we're saying, how do we estimate, um, okay, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to estimate this population value p. And we're going to use p hat to do that. Okay, just like with estimating mu, we use x bar, yeah. and estimating sigma squared, we use s squared, p hat is that same relationship to p. Okay. We have to denote, um, so whenever you see something over it, at least for these cases, like p hat or x bar, they're representing an estimate of this population value. Okay, so confidence intervals. Right? Confidence intervals still work, even if we don't have a nice continuous distribution. And this, like paying attention to this particular slide, let's look at the confidence interval here. We're going to take p hat, and because it was on the previous slide, let's review it. What is p hat? How do I estimate it? Right, number of successes over number of trucks. Okay. Um, the 1.96. Why 1.96? 95% confidence interval, right? That 1.96 is more or less the default value you're going to see in these cases. Um, and the square root of p times 1 minus p over n, why is that there? What does that quantity represent? Right. It's a standard deviation, right? 
it's a square root. If you say variance, I'm going to say you're right, but we're just going to, right, we have a square root value going on here. So this structure is similar to what you saw last week, right? We have our estimate, which is the sample average, and this should say, um, and it's plus or minus 1.96 times the standard deviation of that sample average. Okay, so this structure is not really going to go away. Where you have an estimate, 1.96 is almost always there just as a default. Um, and then we have the standard deviation. So this underlying structure is always there for our confidence intervals. Okay? It's something that we're just going to see over and over again. Um, this brings up an interesting question, though. So p hat is an average, right? Number of successes over number of trials. But the individual observations are not normally distributed. Right? That's just pretty clear. Either they're a zero or they're a one. Clearly that does not behave like a normal distribution. So what we're transitioning into for this week, this is tying up the slides from week three, is we're going to ask, okay, if we take this approach and make this confidence interval, is this still valid? even if these individual observations only can take on a value of zero or one. It turns out yes, because we're not just going to take you down a bad path, and of course like this, but we're going to explore why that's the case as we get into our week four material. Okay? And don't worry, the date on here might not match yours. I had to update a little typo, otherwise everything is still the same. And I will put those slides up a little bit later. All right, so let's say, because we're going to flip a coin 30 times, and it's fair. We're going to say we know, before going into it, that this is a fair coin. And p hat ends up being 0.47. All right, I mean, you're not going to see in a sample of 30, perhaps, exactly 15 and 15. But 0.47 is not far off. Um, that's one of the frustrating things about statistics, is sometimes you can say, oh, well, intuitively, like that should, that should happen. We're concerned with saying, OK, we're not just going to focus on your intuition, but think about why that's actually the case. Like you think, oh, yeah, this should behave like this on, on the long run. We're going to say, well, why might that actually be true? Right? This does not look anything like a normal distribution. We flip a coin 30 times, and we have 16 zeros or failures and 14 successes. Right? So the outcomes themselves have a Bernoulli distribution. We know that. Because p, we know p beforehand. But what about p hat? So let's think about comparing this. If we, that was from a sample size of 30. Let's say we flipped a coin 1,000 times. That would be very boring, very painful. Um, but we took 1,000 samples of size 30. And so we get 1,000 values of p hat. So let's think about this. Would these values all be different from each other? All right, so we're getting p hat. This is going to be, we're going to do this 1,000 times. Should they be different? Always the same? No idea. At least a little different. Right. Um, some, we expect some differentiation in our observations, but it's probably not going to be likely that we're going to see, let's say, 20 of the samples um, end up having a p hat, p hat value of 0.01, 20 of the samples end up having a p hat value of 0.5. We're more likely to see p hat values that are closer to 0.5 than we are 
further away. Right? Just by nature of we know that the coin is fair. So if we do this, look at the sampling distribution, what do you think it should look like? So two th like this, because we have the two bars here, similar to that. No. no? Where's the disagreement coming from? The sample distribution of the outcomes or of the p. The sample distributions of p hat. It's going to be greater or less than fifty. Okay. Okay. All right. So I'm hearing some hypotheses of normal. Right? This is, so let's think about the process that's generating this distribution. I'm going to flip a coin 30 times. It is, based on it being a fair coin, my expected value or expected amount is to get 15 successes in those 30. But in a sample size of 30, we have a lot of variability. Right? It could, it's possible, but not as likely, that we see maybe 9 or 10 successes or 21 or 22 successes. But we expect those things to happen less often than seeing 15 successes, or 14, or 16. And so this is exactly why we see a sampling distribution like this, where, like we thought, we're more likely to see a proportion of success that's close to 0.5, and less likely to see a proportion of success that's like down here at 0.2. Okay. So even though we started with something that looks like this, where the outcomes are not normally distributed, when we looked at the mean or the number of successes over the number of trials, this variable is normally distributed. Okay. So we're going to talk a lot about normality and things uh, during the course of this semester. One of the things people tend to focus on a lot when they get data is they say, oh, well, if I want to do anything with this, this variable has to be normally distributed. No, that's not the case. Um, and it's very rare in a lot of cases that you would see that kind of variable be normally distributed. But when we look at the sampling distribution or the distribution of the mean, we see normal, a normal distribution. And that's the idea of a central limit theorem, is that whatever the distribution of our original variable, binary, whatever it might be, when we look at the sampling distribution of the mean, it's going to be normally distributed, assuming that we have large enough sample sizes. Reason for this is that we can think about p hat and most of the stats that we're going to come across in this course is a sum of random variables. Right? We talked about binomial being a sum of Bernoulli random variables. So if we look at this, and the central limit theorem says, we would get the same histogram pattern that we just saw here for any sum or average of IID random variables. So it doesn't matter how the random variable is actually distributed. It just matters that if we look at, we look at a sum of, let's say, whatever random variable, whatever parameters we're going to see, we look at a sum of those random variables and assume that they are independent and identically distributed, we are going to see this same pattern every time. So this is a really, 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 okay, I said three reallys. Everything the rest of the semester, I'd say, has to be two or less, because this is the most important thing. Um, with the central limit theorem, we, can, we know what the distribution of the sum or average is going to be every time. No matter what, how the random variables are distributed, if we look at a sum or an average of them, it is going to be normally distributed. So more formally stated, 
again, let's, this is a more notation heavy slide, so let's try to break down what these different pieces mean. So we're going to say x bar is the average, right? x bar up to this point we've said is the average. And in this case, it's the average of n iid random variables. So we're saying x bar is the result or the average of n independent and identically distributed random variables. We looked at one example where it's Bernoulli, and, but it could be any other type of distribution. In this case, where each random variable has a mean of mu and a variance of sigma squared. All right, again, this is the say, when we say identically distributed, that's why we're saying each random variable has the same mean and the same variance. Okay, that's what IID represents. Okay. So when we look at X bar, which is the average, something we talked about last week, X bar itself has a distribution where the mean is mu and the variance is sigma squared over n. So with x bar, or our average, what's going to happen when, so if, as n increases, our approximation is going to get better. Why do we know, based on what we have up here, that as n gets bigger, our approximation will get better? What does it mean for our approximation to get better? Maybe that's an important question to preface this with. Yeah, the confidence interval. So when a confidence interval becomes narrower, or a distribution becomes narrower, that also tends to go along with a decrease in variance. Right? If you have a lot of variance, then your estimate is probably not going to be very good. But if you can control that variance and in fact shrink it, it's going to be better for you. So if we look at x bar, and it's normally distributed with mean mu and variance of sigma squared over n, as this value of n gets bigger, what happens to the variance? It gets smaller, right? As n goes from 20 to 30 to 40 to 50, that variance value is going to get smaller. So what that does to the distribution is it makes it more narrow. So if you look at a larger sample size, for example, your 95% confidence interval as you get a larger uh, sample size is going to be a lot better. Right? That confidence interval is going to shrink. So this is why when we, have sample, when we talk about sample size, it does a lot of things for you. And one of them is that it makes your estimates better. Right? It does, it has a more uh, precise estimate. Now, just as a note of caution, when I say it gets precise, right, precision is one part of it. Just because I'm getting precision doesn't mean I'm getting accuracy. Right? Precision just means I'm narrowing in on a particular estimate. Accuracy, on the other hand, is the question of how do I know I'm narrowing in on the right estimate? <laughs> and that depends on a lot of other things in terms of like how you set up experiments, how you get your data. It's not something that sample size can generally control. Um, if you set up a bad experiment or a bad survey uh, or sample in an ineffective way, no matter what your sample size was, uh, it's not going to make it better. right? You it's very possible that you're narrowing in on a bad estimate. And this is something that I see come up a lot when people talk about um, things like big data. And they're like, well, data is allowing us to do all of this stuff. Well, lots of data is good. But if that data, let's say, for some reason, might lead you to an inaccurate estimate, having a lot of it doesn't help you at all. It just gives you more confidence in a bad estimate. So accuracy is 
Yeah, you can. So if I say, so let's say that I was going to do an experiment here, and I wanted to look at the average GPA of students at the university. And I walked into the law school. I was like, I'm going to do my experiment here. And so I'm going to sample, I don't know how many people in the law school, a lot. And I'm going to take a big sample, like 1,500 students, from this law school. Well, you're going to get a very good estimate of the law school average GPA, but that's not going to be a good estimate of the university GPA for the reason they have a forced curve on their grading. Okay, so this idea of accuracy is very much controlled about how well you're sampling from your population, um, and so it's. But just because you get a lot of people or a lot of observations doesn't mean that you have an accurate result. This, these things get confounded a lot, and I hear that discussion in big data when I'm doing like consulting and stuff. Be like, we have all of this data. Do things with it. Well, I don't know how accurate it is. I don't know how they collected it. I don't know like what what population are you trying to say things about. And so just because you have a lot of data doesn't necessarily mean you have something good. That's a big point of contention. So based on what we just said, for a normal random variable, what is this? X minus mu over sigma? What sh that should ring some bells in your head. What is that? Associated with a letter of the alphabet. T score. Or what does Ju Julian have to call it? Z score. So welcome to a difference between Canada and the United States. Um, so I kind of have thought about changing to Z score. It sounds a lot cooler. But um, so x minus mu over sigma is our standardization of a variable. Okay, it is the z score, the z score. Julian, if you're listening, I don't really know how to do this correctly. Um, so we have x minus mu over sigma, and we know that is normally distributed with a mean of zero and a standard deviation, a variance and standard deviation of one. So we can do something nice here. We can restate the central limit theorem and say, okay, so if I look at x bar, so in this case, we, in this case where we have the z score, we're just looking at x minus mu divided by sigma. In this case, we're looking at x bar minus mu and we're dividing it by sigma over the square root of n. Okay, this is a point that I will, I'm going to write this on the board. I'm going to try to make sure that next time I figure out a way. So if I'm going to write things, it's recorded as well. Um, but if we know that x minus mu over sigma normally distributed. So we look at x bar. So what we're going to do is we're going to standardize x bar. We're going to take the z score of x bar. Okay, so if we look at like a standard, a, a typical z-score, we have our, um, sorry, so our best estimate for x-bar is, and it's trying to estimate mu in this case. So we're going to have x-bar minus mu, but we need the standard deviation of x-bar. Right, the standard deviation is the piece that always goes in the denominator. Well, how do I get the standard deviation of x bar? All right. So we need the variance, and we can take the square root of that. What is the variance of x bar? Right. This is the variance of x bar, the square root of this value is going to be sigma 
over the square root of n. So to do this z-score, or the standardization for this variable, we need to have sigma over the square root of n down here. And just like our z-scores, we know that if we do this, this is going to be normally distributed with a mean of 0 and a variance of 1. How are you guys feeling about this? Okay, thumb, like, wavering, like, somewhere in the middle. Okay. So, a couple of important things here. The reason that we can do this when we take a z-score and we know that it will be normally distributed on the other side, what has to be true about the original variable? approximately normal. Okay. This is um, definitely one of the questions that tripped up a number of you on the quiz where I asked a question about if you are given data and I take a z-score, standardize it, it's going to be normally distributed with a mean of 0 and a variance of 1. I said nothing about whether the original variable was normally distributed. Okay. You have to know that you're coming from an original variable that is normally distributed. In this case, we know x bar is approximately normal, which is why when we do this standardization here, we also get a variable that's normally distributed. That piece is really important. Remember that if you, have, uh, if you just have data and you have a variable and you take the z-score of all of those um, of that variable, it's not going to magically <coughs> become normal. Okay. You have to be working from an original normally distributed value. So, thinking about this transition. So we have, we've gone from saying, okay, we have x, and this is, this has some distribution. All we know that x is i of e. Okay. The central limit theorem allows us to say, okay, x bar, no matter what the distribution of this original variable is, is normally distributed with a mean of mu and a variance of sigma squared over n. Okay, so that is what the central limit theorem allows us to do. Well, the nice part is <clears throat> we know that if if a variable is normally distributed, then if we take <clears throat> excuse me, if we take its z-score What's going to be true? Mm -hmm. With a mean of 0 and a variance of 1. <clears throat> and so we can say x bar minus mu over sigma over the square root of n is normally distributed with a mean of 0 and a variance of 1. So this piece is because of Central limit theorem. Okay, this piece is a property that we learned about talking about z scores. If we, so, we go from x being anything. All we know is it's i d. When we look at the distribution of the mean, it's going to be normally distributed with that mean and that variance. And well, let's just say, for sake of what we know, it's much easier to work with. A standard normal distribution. So we're just going to do the z score of all these observations, and it's going to be normally distributed with a mean of zero and a variance. 
So this whole the reason for this part being so important is that we can start with a variable that is a sum of a bunch of random variables. In the case, we had binomial and Bernoulli. And we know how that mean is distributed. And more so, because we know that mean is normally distributed, we take a z-score. It is going to be have a standard normal distribution. So this allows us to say if we have this original set of variables, which are a sum of random variables, we can do a lot of nice things with it just by knowing things about the normal distribution. And that's the connection here that matters a lot. So this allows us to do a lot of more things. We don't have to know anymore that the original variable is normally distributed because we know its mean is going to be. And we can transform that mean into using the standardization to be on a scale that we're very familiar with. Where, let's say, here we would expect 80 or sorry, 68 percent of the observations to fall between a z-score of negative one and one, 95 percent to fall between negative two and two. Okay. Um, let's take about probably a 10 minute break, so 11.25. Uh, when we come back, I'm going to pick up from here and we're going to start looking at some more practical representations of what this means uh, for calculation. No, that's okay. That's also why we just end up having drops during the semester because things happen. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. All right, I need to turn the lights up or I'm going to fall asleep. what you're going to go over next. So yeah. let's say like this is a study I did last year uh -huh. that has, let's say I have all of these weights. Mm -hmm. So I only have this one study, and I can take a mean of all of these weights, mm -hmm. but like how would you apply this on your own something like this? You're only having... Uh, 
But you never, the central limit theorem is not something that like, you're going to apply the data. The um, confidence interval, this idea that we can form yeah. it um, using this technique, relies on the central limit theorem. Okay. Okay? Yeah, so that's what you're going to be using. So I'm saying, like, how nope. do I apply nope. this? No, you don't apply it. It's just, okay. no, you just know like, it's the theory behind why we can do it. Got it. So I think we'll get started again. I think everybody's. We had anybody missing? No. All right. So I had a great question at the break, <laughs> asking because this is exactly what I wondered for in like my first three SATS courses. So when are we going to apply the central limit theorem? You never directly apply the central limit theorem, and it's an idea. The theory behind a lot of the things that we do. <clears throat> in this case, the reason that we can do things with confidence intervals is because we have the central limit theorem. Right? This is this is that connection. Right? We're looking at 
x, where it's a sum of random variables, where each one is iid, we know how the mean is distributed. So, if we look at a generic confidence interval, the sample average plus, one point, plus or minus 1.96 times the standard deviation of the sample average, we can use that form regardless of the distribution of, the ver of each of the random variables. So if we're looking at, um, we're forming a confidence interval for the mean, which is something that's very important. You see it all over the place. We don't actually have to worry about what the underlying distribution is of each of the observations, assuming that they're ID, because of the central limit theorem. Okay, so in terms of where does the central limit theorem get applied, well, it gets applied at the most basic level of even forming confidence intervals. Um, this is conditional on the sample being large enough. And this, again, is, you know, different people will, you know, disagree some, in some cases very strongly about what large enough means. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. But um, this is Julian's claim with no data. I don't have a good estimate. We're just going to say a bunch or a significant portion of statistical inference relies on the central limit theorem. So we couldn't do most of what we do without this underlying theory, which is why it gets such, um, such important discussion in a course like this. Okay, so how large is large enough? Well, the question is, um, with sample size, how big should n be? Uh, n greater than 20 is a good goal. If you can get to 30, it's very good. Um, this is, this again can be a little bit uh, tricky depending on the context, but some people will think, oh, well, of course I could get 20 people, or 20 observations in this study. What kind of situations do you think it might be the case that getting an observation count of 20 or greater might be a little bit complicated. Low prevalence, it's very difficult to identify and find. Yeah, the population is simply not big enough. Um, in that case, you would be able to fully describe the population, so we may not worry as much about inference. Um, a big one is cost, right? So this is true depending on what the study is. It could be extremely expensive to study and gather data from a specific participant, right? You can imagine if it costs money to send somebody to travel to go interview or gather data from this person, um, it can get very expensive. So the question of how many people to have in a study is certainly not trivial. And in a lot of cases, justification for things like sample size have to be part of like grant submissions and things like that. Okay. So two notes on validity. Sample size is large. We'll just work off of 20 for right now. And the things being averaged are independent and identically distributed. So if you have these two things is true, then the central limit theorem is going to kick in. Um, the question of like what happens when things are not um, independent necessarily, that's uh, an entire other course. Uh, Julian has taught that one in the past, but it's called correlated data. And it's certainly something good to know for when you're looking at you know, tracking people over time and things like that. Because clearly those observations are correlated and not independent of each other. Um, quick note, a lot of things which don't look like an average can be written as one. So. So, our statement so far of the central limit theorem has assumed that we have a known population standard deviation. Right? In practice, it's pretty rare to actually know the population standard deviation, so we use an estimate. 
so the question is, if we replace sigma with s, does this whole thing still apply? Or does everything we've come up with to this point fall apart? Well, you can guess, again, that if it all fell apart, we would probably have a lot of issues. But let's think about why <clears throat> this still works for us. So before we get down that road, we're going to look at uh, just a quick aside. So we said before that this square root here, that comes from what? So the variance, right? So this represents the standard deviation, right? And so the square root is going to give us, sorry, so the variance, once we take the square root of it, is going to provide the standard deviation. So the question we're asking is, can we use the sample standard deviation S instead? Okay. So the answer is yes, we can. But this particular value is slightly more accurate. Okay. This gets into a little bit of nuance. but So yes, we could use s. In this case, this value is slightly more accurate. So this is just a um, comparison here. So if we are looking at, uh, so when you're looking at this graph, so we say model-based standard deviation versus sample standard deviation. So which one is which? When I say model-based standard deviation, are we talking about blue or whatever off-color we'll call this other one? Blue? Okay, why is it blue? Hmm? Right, because it's coming from the square root of, I'm not going to list off all the letters, the square root one. Um, the sample standard deviation is S, right? Okay, so if we look at what's going on here, we have different values for S. What do you notice about how these different values are distributed? So the true standard deviation is the black line. Which one seems to be a better estimate? Blue. At the same time, S doesn't seem too bad. Right? So this is, so in practice, the blue is going to give us a better estimate, but S is not so bad. That was kind of just an illustration of this point here. It turns out that this works quite well okay, pretty well, right, this distinction between, and I thought about that the other day when I was teaching, or I'm in a course in Carlson, where about half the students are uh, from China and India, and like this really important point of the lecture hinged on the difference between pretty well and quite well. These things are very easily missed, and I'm just like, if I, like, learning English as a second language has got to be one of the hardest things. Like the distinct, if your lecture is like, this is pretty well and this is quite well and that's the major point, I think it's going to be missed by a lot of people. Um, but we're going to say, if the sample sizes are large, or greater than 20, then this is going to hold. That if we use S, we can be confident. And again, okay, I can't, can't say confident anymore, can't say normal anymore. My ability to use everyday English language is going to diminish. Um, but this is going to hold. Okay. When sample sizes are small, though, so if we have a sample size of less than 20, we have more uncertainty, right? We have less observations. We have more uncertainty about mu and sigma. The sampling distribution is not normal. And it gets worse 
as you get smaller and smaller sample sizes. So again, the message here, at least in the first part of the course, is if you can get large enough sample, you should do it. <laughs> because there are a lot of things that don't work out as well and don't hold when we start looking at sample sizes that are too small. And we'll talk about what to do in those types of situations in just a second. But it's a problem right now, right? If you're saying, okay, this only holds when n is greater than 20, well, what do you do <laughs> when you have an n smaller than that? So how many of you have heard of the t distribution or heard of something like t test or two sample t test? Well, there's a reason that we don't often, like, when you see things reported, we very rarely talk about a z test and we almost always talk about a t test. Okay, this is, we're going to deal with this statistic um, from the t distribution now. When n is small, so we'll call this less than 20, um, x bar minus mu divided by s divided by the square root of n has a t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. We're going to talk in just a second about what that means to have, like, what is it, what are degrees of freedom exactly. But this t distribution kicks in or allows us to do things when our sample size is not large enough. So it's not like if you don't have a sample size that's 20 or more, you just sort of quit and walk away, right? Some people, some people might. But you can do some nice things with this t-distribution. All right, so one of my favorite topics, you know, is talking about beer. Um, so I'm definitely a beer enthusiast, and I remember learning about this thinking, finally, connection between the two things I like the most. Um, okay, so this T distribution comes from, um, is tightly related to beer. So we have a brewer who applied quantitative science to brewing. Um, he worked in a lab, a famous statistician, Carl Pearson. So samples were really cheap and they were abundant in Pearson's lab. In the brewery, barley was really expensive. Okay? So the samples were cheap and abundant. Brewery, in the brewery, the barley was expensive. So when things become expensive, you have fewer observations or fewer data points, if you might. So what he noticed was that this quantity here, x bar minus mu, divided by this fraction, did not have a normal distribution. And so he derived the t distribution to account for this, about what to do when you have small sample sizes. So he worked for Guinness, but Guinness did not want to publish a trade secret. So he wanted to share this result, this t distribution. Um, well, the paper eventually did appear under an author, student. Okay, no name attached to the article, right, to be anonymous. And so that's why when you hear things talked about t-distribution, it's also known as the student's t-distribution. That's where it was published, under that name. Okay, so when it was actually showed up in Biometrica, the author was just student, to keep things anonymous. That's how he was able to share this, which forms a large foundation of what we're going to do in the course. Um, so in sort of moving from that point, thinking about what the t-distribution does for us. And I said there's a couple of, there's something new here. We have something called de degrees of freedom. Um, our param uh, that is the parameter for the t-distribution. What degrees of freedom is referring to is the number of values in the final calculation of a statistic that are allowed to vary. Okay, don't. What it does is it helps determine the spread. Okay, spread or measure of dispersion. So in this case, if we go back and look at what I described here, the t distribution, we said that this calculation, x bar minus mu divided by s divided by the square root of n, is a t-distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom, where n is the number of observations in that particular data set. 
So the degrees of freedom thing is a little bit new. However, it has also has some nice properties, which should ring some bells. When we say it's symmetric and always centered at zero, that's very much like the standard normal distribution. Symmetric and always centered at zero. Okay. What happens we, so we, when these degrees of, so if I say my degrees of freedom become really large, what do I know about my data set? So if my degrees of freedom jump from 19 to 39, what happened in my data set? May or may not be more variable. So I said the degrees of freedom corresponds to n minus 1, where n is the number of observations in your data. So if I go from 19 to 39 degrees of freedom. Yeah, so I went from having 20 observations to 40. Okay, so as what we would like to happen, though, is, okay, we are talking about the t distribution because we want to account for what happens when we have too small of a sample size. Well, what's going to happen is when we start, we hit that threshold of 20 and get larger and larger, is all of a sudden it's going to look very much like the normal distribution, right? Which is what we, what we would want. So, this is, let's see if I can turn this down a little bit. And it's going to keep getting darker. Okay, so in the red, we have the normal distribution, the standard normal distribution, I should say. And what's going on is on the right, we have sort of the legend saying, okay, for one degree of freedom, that's the blue distribution, that is clearly different than the red distribution. But as the degrees of freedom increases, it begins to behave much more like the standard normal distribution. Okay. So this is just, an, again, it's symmetric, it's centered at zero, and in a lot of ways it behaves just like the normal distribution. What do you notice about what's going on with the tails out here? Hmm? Converse. So for lack of a better precise term, the tails of the blue distribution are fatter than the tail for the normal distribution, the standard normal, right? So what does that mean? So remember that we're still talking about this being tell us, telling us something about the probability of observing a value. So what this is saying is that for um, that if we're working under a t distribution with one degree of freedom we're much more likely to observe an extreme value than we are with the standard normal distribution. Okay? And that's because with the t distribution, we're introducing some extra uncertainty. Right? We're dealing with smaller sample sizes. Our estimates are just not as good. So the plot, it's very plausible, or more plausible, that with the t distribution with one degree of freedom, we're going to see something very strange out here. With a standard normal, there's almost zero chance that we'll see an observation that far from the mean. Okay, so just keep these things in mind that um, they that the t distribution behaves just like the normal distribution, and it's almost indistinguishable from it when you start getting into large sample sizes. And I just answered my own question. So, okay. The T statistic does not, um, hmm, that should say Z statistic. I'm sorry about that. So, okay, so which one of these does T or Z depend on N? Before I go back and actually fix the slide. T, right? Because that, the sample size refers to and gives you the number, the degrees of freedom. Okay, and so and the degrees of freedom tells you a lot about what's going on with the distribution. With the z distribution or the standard normal, 
Sample size is not going to affect it. It just is going to behave like that. All right, so let's think about a couple of examples of when we might use the t distribution. And this is a point, um, so again, we're assuming if our variables x1 to xn are independent and identically distributed, right, that's what having mean mu and variance sigma squared, apparently it was a typo day for me and working on the slides, um, but you're saying their id, n is small, notice that we're referring to saying n is less than 30 here, okay, this is for me, and people might disagree on this, it's kind of, there's a little bit of wiggle room between 20 and 30 for your sample size. Um, I tend to use, for myself, like 30 as a cutoff, 25 or 30, um, to where I feel comfortable using something like the normal distribution. But again, the T distribution is certainly applicable and um, different enough from the z distribution or the normal distribution that if you have a sample size of maybe less than 30, it's worth thinking about. So that's sort of nice. Is it like safer? Yeah, it would, be, it would be a little more conservative to use the t distribution for sample size of less than 30. Um, I don't know if anyone's going to really you know, push back really hard on you for making that decision. That's just my personal preference. Certainly once you get above a sample size of 30 though, it's such a close approximation to the normal that there's no reason to keep using it, right? No one's, you should not use a t-distribution with like degrees of freedom of like 400. So it's indistinguishable from a normal distribution. So what happens in this case where we have sigma unknown and we're going to estimate it using s is we have to um, do something a little bit different when it comes to our confidence interval. So the 1.96 <coughs> was working from the normal distribution. All right, we knew between a z-score of negative 1.96 and 1.96, that captured 95% of the observations. Right. So thinking about what we know about this distribution, let's go back and look at this for a second. So I want to keep the same level of confidence, but I'm going to use a t distribution with degrees of freedom of 3. Should that 1.96 increase or decrease for the, to keep the same level of confidence? I've heard both. Decrease, increase. No one said stay the same, so. Um, all right, so let's think about this. For this normal distribution, our red distribution here, we know that between negative 1.96 and 1.96, right, that's going to capture 95% of the observations. Well, if the tails, if we're looking at the green distribution, or let's say blue, just for ease of distinction, for the blue distribution, to capture that same percent of observations, we're going to have to go further out. Right? So if I said for red that there were 95% of the observations fell here, but now this blue distribution, it doesn't have all of this same area here. Right? There's this gap that it has to make up for. So you're going to have to go further out in the blue distribution to capture that same percentage of observations. So it ends up being, instead of 1.96, we have a value, we'll look at a table in a second, but it's going to be larger. So when you're using, and so thinking about what that means, if we go from 1.96 to something like 2.2, what's that, what is that going to do to your confidence interval? It's going to be wider, right? And so using the t-distribution for the same level of confidence is going to result in a wider confidence interval. Okay, and that's normal, right? Get it again. Um, that is what we want. Right? We have introduced added uncertainty, and so our confidence interval is going to be wider. 
That's what we think should happen, and that's what happens with this t-distribution. So this table is partially for your reference, partially just to illustrate uh, what happens for various levels of, uh, for degrees of freedom. So if we're looking at two observations, just probably don't do a study with two observations. Just generally speaking, it's, but look what happens with the confidence interval. The confidence interval for a t distribution versus a normal, it's essentially six times as wide. You see that multiplier here? This is 12.7. That is probably an entirely useless confidence interval, right? The precision is just not going to be very good. But when we start talking about five observations, 10 observations, 50, right? This uh, this confidence interval is behaving more and more like the one with the normal distribution, which is what we want. Of course, when it gets up to like 200, they're virtually indistinguishable from each other. Um, but even with 10, right, 2.26 versus 1.96, yes, you're adding uncertainty, but it's perhaps not terrible. Uh, when you get to 50, right, you're talking four one hundredths of a difference which translates to like an like interval that's like 0 0.08 wider. So this is just evaluate this is just illustrating that as you accumulate more and more observations, your uh, t distribution is going to behave like a normal distribution. Question. Right. Yeah. Basically, we're going to say, of course, this could be dependent on. So let's say in your particular field or your particular lab or something like that, they require a certain level of precision, then you don't just want to say, okay, it's good enough. And so this comes down to like a, a domain specific decision. Um, because if, let's say for even for 50 observations, if this extra, like you can't just write off this four one hundredths of a difference, then you need to make sure that you're still sticking with the t distribution, assuming that you're going to take the conservative approach. You can imagine like in very sensitive areas with like where we're studying health, this can make a big difference. Um, and so that's just sort of more domain specific. For most practical things, like if I'm doing any sort of consulting or statistical work, I kind of just call it good at 30, unless I have a reason to think that's not the case. All right. As important as understanding when to do things is when not to do them. This is probably the part that I think, if I could go back to like graduate level stats and raise my hand more often, I'd be like, okay, you just told me how to do this. When should I not do it? Because if you do things in situations, this happens all the time, in papers, um, in business settings that I go into, for example, they've done things and they've just blindly applied statistics without thinking about when they should have not done it. Um, well, we just went through this whole derivation and said this is what happens with a T uh, confidence interval. It's not often used in constructing confidence intervals. The reason is that when N is large, the difference between using 1.96 and the appropriate value of T is too small to matter with the caveat, which I just mentioned, depends on maybe domain specific. Like if you need a higher level of specificity and you're not okay making that jump to the assumption of normal, then that's a decision you have to make. But of course, when n is small, right, let's say n is 5, 3, something like that, the confidence intervals are probably too wide to be useful. <laughs> So there's this balance between, okay, it gets to this level and you just can use the normal distribution, but if they're too small, they just become useless. So there's a very narrow range if you're constructing confidence intervals in which you might actually use the t-statistic. Where it does show up a lot is in hypothesis testing. Okay. We are going to do a lot with hypothesis testing on weeks five and six in this course, but the t so the t-distribution shows up essentially all the time. 
Um, so we didn't just spend the last half hour, 45 minutes talking about this for nothing. I'm just saying it doesn't show up as often when you're talking about forming confidence intervals. Okay. So to this point, we have talked about confidence intervals for a single mean and confidence intervals for a single proportion. Right? So, so if you think about, um, let's say, election data, this is, went down a dangerous path from looking at stuff in the fall because it was just so much of it. Um, but very often you're doing comparisons, right? You're looking at one candidate compared to another, or you're comparing performance of one person to another depending on what the data is. So you not only just want to have, okay, is my estimate for the average weight of this population, like how good is it, or what's the range? I want to know, is there a difference between this group and this group? And so that requires you to form a confidence interval for differences between groups, both for a mean and a proportion. So going back to this you know, structure that we've used again and again, we have our estimate, plus or minus our multiplier, 1.96 in most cases, times the standard error. So what I'd like you to do in your groups, write down the formula for the two confidence interval types we've learned thus far. Okay. So it would be, I think it's going to be helpful for you to individually write them down and talk about it in your group. But the reason that I'm doing this is so we can go from the form of the sync for the types we've talked about now to thinking about how we extend those to looking at differences between groups. Okay? All right, so first of all, what are the two confidence interval types we've learned thus far? Well, central limit theorem applies to all types of confidence intervals, but we've done it for two specific types of statistics. 
Okay, so continuous. So in the continuous case, we are talking about what? The mean, right? And what were we talking about in the case of discrete or looking at successes? Proportion, right? So mean and proportion. These two things are very important. So we have um, in our first case, x bar is going to represent our mean, right? And then we have p hat for the second one. And this is going to be plus or minus in both cases. Let's just use 1.96 just as a default. And what's the last piece here for the first one? S over the square root of n? Okay. And what about here? It's going to be the square root. Right? Just rolls right off the tongue, all of those. Um, this gets really messy, so one thing that I'm going to ask you to keep in mind, especially when we start looking at group differences, Memorizing these formulas is something that I don't expect you to do, but understanding how they're formed is a different story. So these three pieces, right, our estimate, multiplier, and our standard error, understand that those three things are always going to come into play when we're talking about our confidence intervals. Okay, so... When we're talking about mu1 minus mu2, right, it sh shouldn't be shocking that we're going to, our estimate of mu1 minus mu2 is going to be x1 bar minus x2 bar, where let's say x1 is, we're referring to two different groups, right? Mean of group 1, mean of group 2. Um, so we need the standard error, and without doing any sort of uh, derivation, just know that the standard error is represented by this nice little formula here. Okay. Um, now this assumes that these two values are known, right? Sigma 1 and sigma 2 are known. In the case where n is large, we can just use 1.96 as our multiplier. And if n is small, we can use the t-distribution. Question? Uh, not if they're coming from different groups. Right? This is, we're often forming a confidence interval for difference between two groups. Let's say we, like, let's say we want to look at um, average height of two different groups. The, the sigma 1 and sigma 2, um, it depends on how, what the population is defined as, right? Like, are you talking about people as a whole, like everyone in the United States? Then, yes, you have sigma 1 and sigma 2 are probably the same. But depending on how you define your population, right, which is going to depend on how you define your group, they're probably not going to be equal to each other. So, in the interest of... I know this is where Julian is going to pick up on Wednesday, so I'm going to stop here. Um, any questions before we head out for the rest of this fantastic Monday? All right. Well, I will. I will see you next Monday. But if you have questions in the um, between now and then, be sure that you're asking. Like particularly with respect to programming, we want to make sure that things are clicking for you. Um, and we'll make sure to do our best if they're not. <laughs>